<clears throat> All right. So we are continuing. That's right. I'm going to say it again. We are continuing in the Gospel of Matthew. So um, I don't know how long this series is going to take. It's going to take a while, um, but I am committed to it. So I hope you are committed to it as well. Uh, so we are going to glean the book of Matthew for every possible little nugget of truth that's in there. And let me tell you, there are a lot of nuggets of truth in the Gospel of Matthew. And so today, I want to talk a little bit about jots and tittles. Jots and tittles. This is that uh, famous passage where Jesus is, is talking about, you know, the, the law and how he came not to destroy the law and how he came to fulfill it. And that's a really interesting thing when you think about what Jesus came to do. He came to fulfill the law. He didn't come to abolish the law or to do away with it. He came to, to fulfill it. And there's a very, in, a very, very important nuance there between fulfilling and abolishing. So you might think, well, you know, it has the same sort of effect, right? Like as Christians, we know that um, we, we don't have to worry about wearing clothes with two different types of fabrics, like in Leviticus, right? We don't need to worry about eating bacon, right? We eat bacon, but the law tells us that, you know, the Old Testament law says you shouldn't eat bacon, right? Or shrimp, right? You shouldn't eat shrimp. We, we know that. According to the Old Testament, you shouldn't eat shrimp. But yet as Christians, in the, in the New Covenant, we enjoy these things, right? We enjoy bacon. We enjoy shrimp. Most of our clothes are actually made from different types of fabrics and stuff. So, so there's this sense in which, you know, we're, we're sort of disobeying the Old Testament, we're disobeying the Old Testament law. What do you mean we're disobeying the Old? Now, I'm not preaching here today that we're going to go back to the Old Testament standard. Okay, we're not going there. But you see, what, what happens here is, is we often get a little bit of confusion by what it means to abolish the law and what it means to fulfill the law. Right? Jesus did not come to abolish the law. That is to, to cut the Old Testament out and do away with it entirely and, and just leave it as is. Right? But he came to fulfill it. Fulfill it. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So Matthew chapter 5, if you have your Bibles with you, um, please stand with me. I know we haven't been standing recently, um, but please stand with me as we read through um, the words of Jesus. That's Matthew chapter 5. Verses 17 to 20. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least <coughs> in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be great, called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You may be seated. That's a pretty crazy warning. That's a pretty, pretty intense phrase coming out of our Lord's mouth. Listen to this. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Hear what Jesus is saying here, that this matter of righteousness, which will tie to the law in just a moment, but he's saying this, this matter of righteousness is, is, is so incredibly important that if you don't meet one standard, if you don't meet this standard that he's talking about, which is greater than what the Pharisees and the scribes are doing, if you don't meet this standard, there will be no entrance into the kingdom of heaven for you. Hear this, if you don't meet this standard of righteousness, there is only hellfire awaiting you. This is what Jesus is saying. By extension, what he's saying here when he's talking about the scribes and the Pharisees, he is saying that, that they don't meet that standard either. The scribes and the Pharisees will not enter into their kingdom of heaven with their hearts in the state that they are currently in. Now, you need to understand something about the scribes and the Pharisees. 
um, right? The Sadducees are also kind of lumped in, although it doesn't explicitly say that here. Um, but these were the religious people of the day, and they were really well known for, for making all these commands and all these rules, and they, they put on this show, right? They, they put on the right clothes, they, they sit in the right places, and, and they say the right things. But, but Jesus rebukes them later and says, do as they say and not as they do. Because they, they load people up with all of these rules and they won't lift a finger to help them. This is Jesus' own words on the Pharisees and the scribes. Don't be the hypocrite is what he's telling them. What he's saying is that in their current state, in the place that they are at, they will by no means enter in to the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't want us to get all haughty and high-minded either and say we're better than the scribes and the Pharisees and hypocrites. No, 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 that's not what Jesus is saying here. In fact, listen, what, he, what he's saying is if your righteousness doesn't exceed that, if your righteousness doesn't exceed that, and here's the thing, is your righteousness, your righteousness will not exceed that on your own. Because you and I, this is the truth, this is the truth, this is the hard truth, is you and I, you and I, we are prone to play the scribe and the Pharisee. And without the work of Jesus in our hearts, we will play the role of the scribe and the Pharisee. So how does this all come? How do we link all this into the, the first little bit that we wrote? Do not, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. See, all this links back to the Old Testament law. So when we're talking about righteousness, when Jesus is talking about righteousness here, specifically, he's referring to righteous acts of the Old Testament law. He, but he's talking about the king. I know he is. But he's, you got to understand that the book of Matthew, we're technically still in the Old Testament here. Do you know that? We are technically still in the Old Testament at the time Jesus is preaching this message. So what that means, what that means is that righteousness at that point was obtained by the law. Okay? And of course, righteousness being obtained by the law was rather something that was very difficult, if not impossible, impossible to obtain. And, and Jesus recognized this. Now, the other thing we got to understand is why is Jesus starting off this way, right? If you, look, if you look at the Gospel of Matthew, right? Remember where we're starting in chapter 5? It's the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. How did Jesus start the Sermon on the Mount? He started with the Beatitudes, right? These are, these are characteristics of the Christian life that are blessed, right? That you're, you're blessed if you're, if you're poor in spirit. You're blessed if you're, if you're persecuted. You're blessed if you have mercy. That's not in order, but this is how he starts. He starts with these, with these character blessings, and then he goes on to tell us that we're the light of the world, and then he begins with this opener. So that, that's where we are with this beginning passage. Now, when he says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets, you need to understand something. He's not just saying this because it's something cool to say in a sermon, right? He's, he's responding also, he's responding also to some accusations against him, right? It's no wonder when you look a few verses down, you see that he's, he's, he's chiding the scribes and the Pharisees because during Jesus' time in ministry on earth, how many times was he accused of trying to do away with the law of Moses? How many times was Jesus accused of, of, of being the one who's departing from the commandments of the Old Testament, right? Over and over and over again. So he says this, do not think, okay, do not suppose. Uh, one Bible translation says, do not assume that I have come to destroy the law. See, Jesus is offering also up himself an apologetic for why, for why he is here. He's not here to destroy the law. He's not here to do away with the tools that tell us what sin is. So Jesus is not doing, but it says he comes to fulfill. So destroying or fulfilling, what do we mean? He's not coming to destroy, but to fulfill. So what does it mean to destroy? Okay, look up the word, kataleo. It just simply means that. Destroy or dismantle. Okay, to annul, right? He's not coming to annul the law. He's not coming to dismantle the Old Testament. He's not coming to set fire to it and destroy it and do away with it. The law shows that there is work to be done. And that work has to be done. There's a, 
An example, right? You, you take, for example, uh, ancient societies. I'll, I'll use Egypt as an example, right? Egypt. So you get a, a mighty Egyptian king, you know, Pharaoh, some sort, comes out and he, he, he goes to battle and, and say he takes all of his men to battle against the city. And, and, and the city, they send out all of their, all of their women and children. And they send out all their women and children to fight this army. And the women and children overcome this powerful Pharaoh's army, right? So, so what happens, right, is they'll, they'll go into the tombs at the death of this king and they'll write down all over the wall, like, all their accomplishments and stuff. And, and uh, what'll happen is that when they come to this story, they won't write it down because it's really embarrassing. It's really embarrassing. In fact, what's, what will often happen is a king will come later and say, we didn't really like him. He was really embarrassing. And they will literally destroy the record and write their own record inside. So this is, this is kind of like destroying, destroying the law, right? He, he didn't come to do that. Jesus didn't come to take an eraser to the Old Testament and erase it all. He didn't come to take his eraser to all the commands of the, of the Old Testament and to erase them all without any thought afterwards. No, it says he came to fulfill. So what does it mean to fulfill? In another Greek word, plero, means to come to an end, okay, to come to an end, or to make complete or to fill. Okay, you think of a, a cup of milk, right? You know, one of the kids come up and Dad, I'm thirsty. Okay, let's get you something to drink. You grab a cup and you fill it. And the thing about a cup is, is you can, you can fill it halfway, right? When, when we have kids, we only fill it halfway because you know they're going to spill it, right? That's, that's what kids do. Um, but, but you can fill it. And, and in order for the cup to reach its maximum full capacity, right, you got to fill it right up to the brim. Okay, you fill it right up to the brim. And so when we talk about fulfilling the law, what we're talking about is someone who can obey in every little aspect of the law. And not just obey every aspect of the law, but fulfill every prophecy in the Old Testament law. Or, or fulfill every prophecy that has to do with his first coming and his second coming. Who can do that? The Lord can, and the Lord is going to fulfill. Um, so it's an empty cup waiting for something to fill it. Now the question is, well, you can think of the law as a cup that can be filled with righteousness. Every command that is obeyed in the book of the law is another little bit of that cup that is being filled. And as we look into the life of Jesus, we see that when he, com when he obeyed the law, he obeyed the law in every single part, therefore fulfilling the entire law from front to start. It's, now, now this, is, this is where that nuance comes in, right? It's not that Jesus came and destroyed the law and now we can eat bacon. No, that's not what it is. Jesus came and fulfilled the law and became our righteousness so then we can eat bacon. You understand how that works? It's not that the law is destroyed, but the law is fulfilled. Very important. Okay, the law, the Old Testament, the Levitical law, uh, and the prophets, they all have a set of requirements that must be fulfilled. Hebrews 10.1 explains this for us. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. So understand this. Okay, the law is just a shadow. The law was a shadow. All of the sacrifices in the Old Testament, the grain offering, the, the heave offering, the, you know, you bring the doves and, and, and you bring the cows and, and you, you slaughter them and you sacrifice them to the Lord and, and Yom Kippur and, and the red heifer and all these things, right? All that stuff is, is commanded in the Old Testament law. But, but what Hebrews is telling us here, in fact, what the book of Hebrews is altogether is telling us that those sacrifices were not enough. They cannot make you perfect. Yes, they, they had a temporary way of dealing with sin, um, but you had to offer them continually in order to live under that blood, so to speak. And so the book of Hebrews tells us about how Jesus, listen to this, how Jesus is the fulfillment of the law of sacrifices. Later on in Hebrews, it tells us that he sacrificed himself once for all. 
See, the point of Hebrews is this, is that even though in the Old Testament you had to make sacrifices day after day after day in order to cover your sins, to cover your sins, go back to the temple, offer some more, cover your sins, sin, go back to the temple, you know, offer another sacrifice. Jesus did it once and for all, once and for all. The greatest sacrifices of all sacrifices was made when Jesus died on that cross. See, Jesus fulfilled this is important. Jesus fulfilled the laws of the sacrifice. In fact, the laws of the sacrifice pointed to Jesus. Now, here's the thing. If Jesus hadn't fulfilled any of those laws, there would be no forgiveness for us today. See, Jesus went through a lot in order for us to walk in his forgiveness. So, in other fulfillments, that's the fulfillment of the sacrificial laws, uh, he fulfilled a number of prophecies. The Old Testament tells us a lot about Jesus when he, when he would come the first time, right? We call that his first advent, and when he would come the second time, which is yet to happen. That's the second advent. But listen to this. There, there's, an estimated of approx there, there's an estimate of approximately 300 places in the Old Testament that prophesy of Jesus' first coming. 300 places! The Old Testament in 300 places give us unique aspects, very specific aspects of the life of Jesus, and he fulfilled every single one of them. Not one jot or one tittle fell to the ground. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But understand this. Listen, when Jesus was born, there was a prophecy about that. Matthew 25, verse 6 tells us about the fulfillment of that prophecy. So they said to him, you know, talking about where is Jesus going to be born? It says, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written, it is written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. It's a prophecy about Jesus. After Jesus was born, he, he had to run away. Well, uh, Joseph and Mary, they had to kind of run over, they flee to safety. We call that the flight into Egypt. Matthew chapter 2, verse 14 tells us about this. When he arose... He took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Fulfillment after fulfillment after fulfillment is happening in the life of Jesus. His healing of the sick. Matthew eight seventeen that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. His betrayal, Matthew 27, 9, then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was pierced, whom they of the children of Israel priced. You see that? 30 pieces of silver. Very specific, very nuanced, very detailed prophecies were fulfilled. Why? Because they had to be. They had to be. His resurrection. <coughs> Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And the third day, he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. You say, but Dwayne, that's not Old Testament. Yes, it is. Remember, the New Testament doesn't start until Jesus resurrects from the dead. And Jesus, being a prophet, by the way, Jesus was a prophet, right? He was a prophet also. He made a prophecy here. He was prophesying about his own death and his own resurrection. And he was fulfilling that. Every time the Lord spoke through a prophet about Jesus, Jesus fulfills that. And then, of course, we have the end times, right? We have all the prophecies concerning the end times. Now, we're beginning to see those prophecies begin to fulfill. But the ones related to Jesus are yet to be fulfilled. Why? Because he hasn't yet returned. We see prophecies fulfilled of Israel. Praise the Lord. We see that happening. They become a nation in 1948. Talk about Ezekiel and dry bones coming to life, all that kind of stuff. But listen. Listen, there's a plethora of, of uh, prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled in the second coming of Christ. Okay, so what does that mean? It means though the law and the prophets are being fulfilled, they are not entirely fulfilled just yet. Okay, the prophecies involving us 
uh, involving the sacrifice and involving forgiveness and the ability of Jesus to fulfill the moral law. Okay, those have been fulfilled. We just await the fulfillment of the prophets. So the law, the law is fulfilled. The prophets are not fulfilled. Okay, the prophets are partly fulfilled. It's an interesting thought. And so that's, that's how Jesus fulfills the prophets. But then we talk about the moral obligation of the law. And Jesus says, um, but Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill, that's that same word, plero, all righteousness. Then he allowed him. This is talking about the, uh, the baptism of Jesus. It's interesting because the way that it's, it's, uh, it's worded there, right? You ever like hear about the baptism of Jesus and you hear this phrase, well, what does he mean by it? Like, what, why is Jesus being baptized? And we, we covered that uh, a number of weeks ago. Um, but, you know, he's doing it because he needs to. He has to. Why? Because he has to fulfill what is commanded of him to do. He is fulfilling. He is doing. He can't just fluff it off and do away with it. Jesus has to fulfill it. So there, on, next up, Jesus on the fulfillment. <clears throat> Luke 24, 44 to 48. Then he said to them, this is Jesus. These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things, okay, all things, that's key, not some things, not a few things, not most things, but all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding, that's really interesting, um, that they might comprehend the scriptures. Oh, that's key. This is a little rabbit trail here. Have you ever like read the Bible and have a hard time trying to understand that? Ever like read it and you're just like, what? Is, I don't get it. I don't get it. L listen, listen, listen what it says here. It says that he, Jesus, opened their understanding. They opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. He opened their understanding. So if you're having trouble understanding what you're reading, or you're having trouble understanding some sort of spiritual truth, this is what you do. You just pray. You pray. You ask the Lord. You ask the Lord, and he will open your understanding to know. But finishing up here, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Listen, it says, it was necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day. It was necessary for him to fulfill all things. We're spent, I'm, I'm laboring this point, but we need to understand the difference between Jesus coming to, to abolish the law versus Jesus coming to fulfill the law. Again, he didn't come and, uh, and, and just do away with the law so that he wouldn't have to worry about any of the stuff that's in there. Not at all. Rather, Jesus was very concerned, very concerned with everything that was written in the law. Let, let's come to what he says about jots and tittles. Uh, if you come down to uh, 17, and the, or sorry, verse 18, it says, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. So what is this saying? This is saying that Jesus puts the, the utmost importance on the scriptures. He puts the utmost importance on the law of God. Now you remember during his ministry, what's happening is Jesus uh, is being accused by the scribes and the Pharisees of hi and hypocrites of, of, of pushing people away from the Mosaic law, of, of doing away with the law entirely, becoming, becoming an antinomian, someone who's against the law, saying we don't need to follow Moses anymore. But that's not what Jesus came to do. And he's, he's, he's giving a defense here. And what he's saying here is that every tiny aspect of the law is important. Every little word, every little letter, every little point in the law is important. There's not one word that is out of place in the scriptures of the Lord. And when it comes to the law, when it comes to the law, those laws that are in the Old Testament that just seem kind of like, whatever, just kind of like a small little law. He's saying, no, they are not. They are just as important as the little law. Jots and tittles are interesting words to use to, to express this, right? Because what's a jot, right? A jot, if the little, the little Hebrew word or the Hebrew letter yud, okay, yud, it's just like a little, it's like a little dash. It's, you, you, can, you can equivocate that with an English apostrophe. Okay, you, you put a little apostrophe, right? When, when you contract words like don't and your, if you don't get your, your, and your mixed up. Right, the little apostrophe, that's a jot. You know what a tittle is? 
You'd say maybe it's a dot over an eye. It's actually not. It's smaller than that. It's smaller than a dot over an eye. So you take like the, the English letter, like a lowercase n, or you know you have the line on the, let's see if I can do this backwards, the line on your left, and then you kind of arch around, and there's a little nib on the top of that line, you know what I'm talking about? That, that's a tittle, that, that, little, that little nub, right? The letter U, it's the same thing, that little nub at the bottom. So what he's saying is, is the smallest portions of the law The smallest portions of the law of the scriptures are just as important as the bigger portions of the law. And you see this when he, when he expresses further, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So what's he saying here? He is saying, if you are a teacher of the law and you're saying that these parts don't really matter because they don't affect us that much, say, no, we're not doing that. You know, if you, if you teach this way and you teach other men this thing, right, you're going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes on to say, but whosoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Obeying little laws in the mind of Jesus is like greatness in the kingdom of heaven. The little things matter. The little things matter. There are no insignificant laws in the Old Testament. When it comes to Jesus fulfilling the law, not a single jot or tittle will fall from that fulfillment. Everything the law set out to do, it will do through Jesus. Every little thing. James chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. But if you show, oh, that's, uh, yeah, if you show partiality and commit sin, you are convicted by the law as a transgressor. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. It's the thing. In order for the law to do its, you know, its blessings, right? It has to be fulfilled perfectly. Any hands up here for anyone who can fulfill the law perfectly? I asked that question one time and a few people put their hands up. This is back in another church. Not here, not here, definitely not here. <laughs> you see, we rely on another to fulfill the whole law for us. Now, it's also important to recognize this. I wrote this little phrase down, came to me while I was putting this together. But it's this, it's this. Sinful things do not become less sinful because grace is now available to us. Okay, sinful things do not become less sinful because the law is fulfilled. Okay? In fact, what we'll go on to discuss over the next couple of weeks is what you find is that Jesus took the things in the law and he applied them to the heart of the individual. So he made them even more difficult to follow. Why? Because the absence of the law does not mean there's an absence of sin. Okay? There's, there's still going to be sin. And the absence of the law does not mean that there won't be any consequences for sin. There absolutely is consequences for sin. What we need to understand is that our sinful beings, right? When, when we didn't know Christ and we were walking in sin, we were condemned already, as the scriptures say. And you didn't need a law to condemn you. The law was only there to reveal sin. It had no power in the life of the believer to make them righteous. But what it did do is it said, you are a sinner in need of a savior. You are a sinner in need of a savior. You go back to the cup analogy, right? Fulfillment, filling the cup with milk, right? If that, if that cup is only filled 99%, that's not a full cup. You don't make the cup. See, that cup's got to be filled 100%. But see, we are incapable of filling the cup 100%. Either we're going to start pouring the milk in, we're going to fall short of the lip of the cup, or we're going to um, pour a little bit extra in there and we're going to spill it all over the place. Okay, we need somebody to fill the righteousness cup for us. We need somebody to fulfill the law for us, and that's Jesus. That's Jesus. Do not think that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fill, fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Now, 
Here's another question, Christian. Do you hold the scriptures in the same light that Jesus holds the scripture? Do you hold the word of God in the same light that Jesus holds the word of God? Right? Jesus is saying here, not one jot or one tittle will fall from the law. Every little bit matters. Every little word matters. Every sentence, every paragraph, every book, every period, every exclamation point matters. Do you have the same mindset as Jesus when it comes to the scriptures? Do you read them and, and, and take it in and pray for the Lord to help you understand, like our, like our example earlier in, in uh, Matthew? Do you, do you take that in? Or do you just haphazardly read it? Like another book that's uh, in your home library or another article uh, on the website. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? Now, I want to come down to the last phrase here. I think we'll finish up here. It says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. So remember this block of text, what Jesus is saying here. Right? He's defending his, his uh, fulfillment of the law, not the abolishment of the law, because he's being accused by others of doing away with the law of Moses. But see, when he comes back to the scribes and Pharisees, he's pointing them and saying, you guys think you're righteous. You think you're righteous. You think you are doing the right things, but you are not. In fact, if people want to get into the kingdom of heaven, they have to have more righteousness than you. Isn't that interesting? What kind of righteousness needs to be exceeded? That's the question. Matthew chapter 23, verse 25 to 28 gives us an indication. Uh, 23 is all the, the proclamation of the woes on the scribes and Pharisees. And this one is, is very interesting. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, uh, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So when we come back to our passage here, what kind of righteousness do we need to exceed? What kind of righteousness are the scribes and the Pharisees exhibiting? They are, they are exhibiting a righteousness which is outward only. Okay, to, to give you an example, this is what it looks like, okay? You, 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 come into, you, you come into church Sunday morning and you, you say the right things. Praise the Lord, brother. Praise the Lord, sister. You do the right things. You sit, you worship with your hands up and you, you sing loudly, right? You do, you do all the outward things. You, you, you dress right, you know, you dress for the occasion, and you look like you are playing the part of the Christian. And when we look at you from the outside, we just see somebody who looks like they are a Christian. Okay, but a really common and, and really uh, uh, kind of humorous phrase that we've often heard is, you know, just because you go to McDonald's doesn't mean you're a hamburger, right? Just because you go to a church doesn't mean you're a Christian. Okay, just because you, you have a cross around your neck doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just because you carry a Bible around, right, doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just because you can pull your phone out and you got a little Bible app out there and you can show people that. Or, or just because you can quote scripture doesn't, doesn't mean you're a Christian. It doesn't mean you're a Christian. And this is what Jesus is getting at here when he's talking about the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. They look the part. They look like believers. They look like they're, they're obeying the law, but, but inside, this is the key, inside their hearts, they are so far from the Lord. They're putting an act on. You know, you ever wonder why people put an act on? You ever wonder why? There, there's something about appearing righteous before other people. And we talked a little bit about that last week. There's, there's the idea of letting your light shine before men. Yeah, we get that. But then there's this whole idea of doing your righteous deeds in your, in your prayer closet, quietly before the Lord. But you see, what it is, is, is uh, there, there's a certain pride that goes along with, 
with being righteous, with, with, uh, not with being righteous, but with appearing to be righteous, right? A motivator for someone to appear to be righteous is maybe they want to be accepted into a community without having to do the work necessary to be part of that community. You know what I mean? Or, or maybe, maybe they just want to appear to be greater than, than many other people because they're able to do the things that are written in the law. Okay. But where is your heart at? Even, even as, a, as a pastor, I can't see your hearts. I can't see your hearts. I don't know where your hearts are. And uh, it, it's an interesting dilemma because sometimes you, you can see uh, the fruit and the fruit is good. And, and sometimes you don't see the fruit and you go, wow, I, I hope they're doing all right. I'm concerned I'm not seeing any fruit. But you can't see the heart. You can't see the heart. And Jesus' concern here this whole time this whole passage, in fact, for the whole Sermon on the Mount, his concern is to grab your heart. You can say the right things, but if your heart isn't behind it, what good is it? Yeah, I'll give you an example with, uh, with children. You know how children are. I, I'm a dad, so I get a lot of uh, analogies from, from kids, right? Right? You, you see the kids are fighting over something. It, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be like a piece of plastic that they found on the floor. A kid's a fighter. That's what they do, right? Uh, so so they'll, they'll fight over that. And then you hear them fighting. And someone, you know, uh, pulls back and, and punches one of the other kids. And, and you go, what, what do you do that for? I want you to say sorry. And you know what they do is, is, is they'll be like, no. Say sorry. Sorry. And you go, what, what good is that though, right? I mean, that, that's, that's, the, um, um, that, that's the behavior of children. That's the behavior of children, right? They put on this, this external thing just to make you happy and move on. And their heart isn't really in it. And as, as parents, we want to see our kids' heart in their, in their apologies. We want to see the kids' heart in the things that they do. We, we don't want to see our kids just doing things because they want to be noticed, right? We want to see our kids doing things because their hearts are changing into people who care about other people. Right? They're not just going through the motions. It's not about going through the motions. Jesus doesn't like going through the motions. And if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to dive right in. Dive in with your whole heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Every part of you has to serve the Lord. Every single bit of you. If there were jots and tittles inside of you, every jot and tittle inside of you has to serve the Lord. Every bit. There's no aspect of our lives that is outside the grace of God. So we would do well not to put aspects of our lives outside the grace of God. Amen. We need to bring our entire lives and surrender them wholly. The whole heart, the whole mind, the whole body, our whole strength into the Lord. Bring it under subjection to him. Bring it under obedience to him. He wants our whole hearts. He doesn't just one little piece of us. Here's the crazy thing about one little piece of us. If we give him only one little piece of us, we are no better than the scribes and the Pharisees that he told us where our righteousness must succeed. And if we only give him one little piece of us, how will we enter into the kingdom of heaven? You must hand your whole life over to Jesus. You must. There is no part of your life. There is no part of your life taken as a piece or as a whole that can fulfill the requirements that God has on his creation. There is none inside of you. You need to put your whole self in Christ because Christ is the one who fulfilled, not abolished, but fulfilled the law. Put yourself under him, brothers and sisters. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your word that you came to fulfill the law for us, Lord. In our place, you died. We pray that you would help us, God, to take our whole lives and to put them under you, Lord Jesus. We pray that you would help us to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, Lord. That our outward being would be a reflection of the righteousness in our inward being because of you, Lord. We ask, God, that you would help us to walk according to your ways. 
to walk in your commands, Lord. We pray that you would help us to exhibit the fruits of your spirit, Lord, and that we would walk in the righteousness that you have for us. Lord, we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.